Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional, and I hope you are too. Welcome back to Stardew Valley. After spending nearly all of spring of year two waiting for a battery pack, this season is gonna be a little bit more hectic. If there's one thing for certain in Stardew Valley, you are never short of things to do. Let's jump right in to summer of year two. As always, at the start of any season, the first task is setting up our fields to be productive this month. Remember that crops that yield multiple harvests will leave stems in the ground between seasons that you can just scythe away, but those spots will still be watered. It definitely accelerates the first part of a season, taking away a lot of labor. I won't be going for blueberries again this year, though, instead using a desert totem to go visit Sandy. For the summer this year, I'm gonna be growing as many starfruit seeds as I possibly can, but I always forget just how stinking expensive they are. 400,000 gold goes away pretty quickly when you're buying a bunch of these. I stopped in at Pierre's as well to buy some wheat seeds just to have some filler crop to put out. And I'm definitely more focused on social stuff at the moment, although it's still not a priority. As I mentioned before, I'm rich enough to just be giving out salads as gifts right now, which aren't ideal gifts, but hey, it's still friendship. It's definitely gonna make maxing everything out later much easier. Also, because it's Monday, I'm making sure to grab a new community board quest, and then it's back to the farm to fill out all of our prepared space with starfruit. The starfruit wine is gonna make us a lot of money. After unlocking Ginger Island, I made sure to donate the hardwood to get this large stump progress going. The raccoon has additional bundle-style quests that we have to complete for him. We won't see a ton of benefit from this right away, but later when we unlock more stuff from the shop, oh boy. I have some plans, let's just hope I can pull them off. As I gain social standing with all of the townspeople and complete more of these community board quests, we will be encountering more cutscenes. Like this one, where Gus is using the 24 eggs that we got for him to make a gigantic omelette. I will not be covering all of these cutscenes because again, I do encourage you to check these all out yourself. I'll likely only mention the ones that make me giggle. At the end of the day, I decided I felt a little bit poor after all of that spending selling some of that blackberry wine that I made. It's not that expensive, but hey, an extra 56k in the bank is nothing to complain about. With the fields now set, my attention can turn back to Ginger Island. Day two of summer, it's raining out here, so that enables me to get a couple of extra golden walnuts. There are journal scraps around the island that will reveal clues for certain puzzles, or hidden walnut locations. On rainy days, a mermaid appears after unlocking the resort. You can find note blocks and tune them, playing her a song for a handful of golden walnuts. I then spend a good chunk of the rest of the day fishing for that community board quest I got from Willy. Ginger Island has a couple of unique fish, and this all helps us towards our master angler achievement. With the farm and resort now unlocked, I feel like the next best thing to unlock with my walnuts is the fast travel Parrot Express. Now there's a handful of these fast travel options that are gonna help us get around the island a lot more quickly. What can I say? Isn't efficiency really just planned laziness? The next day it's raining again on the island and the plan pretty much remains the same, just hunting down walnuts and fishing for that willy quest. After wrapping that up, it's back to the farm where I have a batch of strawberry wine ready to go. After that, I'm back at the mini forge trying to optimize our enchantments a little bit better. My first priority is the weapon. I want to get the artful enchantment. Artful reduces the cooldown of our special move on the hammer by 50%, aka the smash 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 that I love so much. That also stacks multiplicatively with our acrobat perk at level 10 combat for a total of a 75% cooldown reduction. Once I get that, it's time to start enchanting the tools, starting with the pickaxe where I'm looking for Swift. Swift is gonna make our pickaxe swing 33% faster. I actually get fairly lucky here, getting Artful on my weapon and Swift on both my axe and pickaxe. I'm out of Cinder Shards though, so I'm gonna have to head back to the Ginger Island Mines to get more of those. And that's how I spend the next day, including getting more of these secret notes to reveal more walnut locations that I can hunt down. And that's where the rest of the day is spent, then going home at the end of the night trying to keep myself as organized as possible. For the next little while, the main priority is gonna be Ginger Island progression. I feel I got a little over sidetracked here on the Ginger Island progression instead of, say, setting up the Ginger Island farm, but hey, what are you gonna do? While I still have random chance walnuts to find in the mine, every morning I start off by coming up to the dig site to clear that out, looking for some skeletal fragments, and then I spend as much time as it takes to clear through the Ginger Island mine, grabbing as many cinder shards, dragon teeth from the lava creatures, and any other resources that I can find. After all, I'm gonna need all of them, especially these dragon teeth, but we'll get back to that a bit later. 
On the morning of day six, though, we experience our green rain day for this year. So, okay, plans change today. I'm just gonna be harvesting with my scythe all day. The moss is super and useful and all of that, but it's this fiber that I want so desperately. I don't even feel that I've really been using fiber as heavily as I could be, and I'm still pretty much perpetually out of it. And I do mean I spend the entire day doing this. I'm able to do it much more effectively this year as compared to last year, that's for sure. At the end of the day, I've cleared so much of the map, I'm actually hanging around Robin's cabin just looking for more fiber. Speaking of Robin, I have been visiting her regularly to continue upgrading my house. On the morning of day seven, I finally have the quote, final upgrade, end quote, which unlocks the cellar. The cellar also unlocks the ability to craft casks. Casks are gonna allow us to age things like wine and cheese. Aging them increases the quality and therefore the sell price. Different items take different amounts of time. If you stick in a piece of gold quality cheese, for instance, that you got from a large milk, it will take seven days to age to an iridium quality cheese. That's on the quicker end compared to wine, where if you just put in basic wine, it takes 14 days to become silver, 14 days to become gold, and then 28 days to become iridium. The basement is the only place that you can place casks, and two months per batch is quite an order. Trust me when I say, though, once we have all of that set up, we are going to be making bank. There's, of course, the never-ending chores that I just don't show all of the time, like tending to the greenhouse every other day for our coffee. You can start to see on the edges and the front left corner that I am swapping crops out, though. I'm gonna be using this greenhouse to expand our ancient seed production, which I finally have, as well as our sweet gem berry production. I'll get more into those later, but for now, I thought that you should at least know what I'm doing with the greenhouse. It's finally time to set up that ginger island farm, though, and thankfully, it's raining on the set seventh day again. That means all I have to do is hoe. I don't have to worry about watering this as well. Also, I still don't have enough battery packs, so I'm gonna be setting this up with quality sprinklers expanding to iridiums once I have the resources. Also, this field is gonna be a bit of a Frankenstein for the next little while. We can grow any crop from any season at any time on the island, and there are no crows. As such, I feel that Ginger Island, at least while we're establishing it, is the perfect time to knock off goals like polyculture, which is selling 15 of every crop. You'll also notice in the top right corner, I have a garlic, melon, and wheat growing. These are for the Gourmand Frog Quests, which will give us a total of 15 golden walnuts. The next morning, I want to get those casks working, so I tear down what's in the basement and start setting up my casks. Unless I'm mistaken, this should give us 124 casks. I don't have 124 of anything too exciting at the moment, so I fill them all with strawberry wine. I'm now a little bit stuck in waiting mode on Ginger Island, so I head back to the Stardew Valley mine to finish off a Monster Hunter objective. These skeletons and then the flame spirits on Ginger Island are the last two that I have to complete. Oh, make that just the flame spirits on Ginger Island. Now with that done, I want to prepare the quarry for my next big move. I clear out the entire quarry once again because I'm prepping for, you guessed it, more keg space. In all honesty, I could be putting a lot of this at the farm. I do have the space for it right now, but I really want to keep that open so that I can really work with the space and get a better idea of what I want the final farm layout to look like. The next day, it's back to Ginger Island targeting the same resources I have been all season and more walnuts. I must be getting close to getting all the walnuts in here, but I definitely still want the cinder shards to continue enchanting and forging my gear. Days 9 and 10 are actually fairly boring, just spending the entire time on Ginger Island and in the mines. That is, until I warp home at the end of day 10 and we have another batch of strawberry wine ready. It's definitely too late in the day to be dealing with this right now, and I want to be moving these kegs instead of just refilling them. That sounds like a tomorrow project. Which it is! After pulling all the strawberry wine out and starting to break down these kegs in preparation for the move, the little message pops up telling me that the luau has begun. Aw oh man, the one event that I care about this season. So I make sure to grab something from the chest that's gonna give me the maximum amount of friendship with all of the villagers at the luau and finish chopping down my kegs. It's a little bit unfortunate having the luau cut into the middle of my keg production, but I feel that the friendship is worth it. Also, I mentioned doing something funny this year, but we're gonna have to hold off a little bit longer. I'm still in make people like me mode. 
The luau ends up pretty much cancelling the majority of the day, but I still have enough time to get some of those kegs established. Then on the next morning, it's time to finish getting all of those kegs set up. Oh, and obviously working again. I want these kegs working. This is actually the first time I've ever used the quarry for kegs, and I gotta say, this vertical alignment, I'm really digging. I find that I miss a lot less kegs in this vertical alignment when I'm going up and down the line. With the kegs all set up, I fill them once again with strawberries, and I end up with a couple of kegs left over. First though, I'm making sure to drop down an indicator keg that will be on the same routine as the kegs at the quarry. This way I can see right when I walk out my front door if the quarry kegs are ready or not. My stock of coffee has been kind of dwindling lately, so I lay those last couple of kegs down at our farm just to process some coffee. With the materials that I've been gathering in the Ginger Island mind over the last few days, I now have plenty of cinder shards to continue enchanting my gear. I'm also going to be forging my hammer, which is unique to weapons. I add on an emerald for a little bit of additional speed, and two rubies for additional damage. I also enchant the hoe and watering can with the reaching enchant. This gives us one additional level while charging our tool, now being able to process a 5x5 five five area. It's all random, so it takes a few tries, but this is why I saved all of my prismatic shards. On the morning of day 13, it's back out to the desert to spend all of my money. Our starfruit seeds should be ready to harvest tomorrow, so I want to make sure that I have enough new seeds to plant right back down. Ugh, you know when you make millions and millions of gold and then you're still perpetually broke? <laughs> it's gonna be a great feeling when we break past that threshold. The first crop of wheat is also done on Ginger Island, and the reason I chose wheat is that you're able to get five golden walnuts randomly from harvesting crops. That is exclusive to crops on the island, by the way. I then take those golden walnuts to go and unlock the island trader. They're not gonna have a huge amount for us, but there's a couple things that are nifty to have access to. Then, and I know it's a little difficult to see, I'm up at the tree farm for a little bit of progression. I've completed the prerequisites to now talk to this witchy tombstone flying thing to get it out of the way. This reveals a little tunnel in the northeast portion that's gonna lead us to the witch's hut. There's a henchman, orcish, bodyguard type dude that we have to get past, but I came prepared. This dude loves some void mayonnaise, so I just give him some and off he goes. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, I'm trying to get in your boss's house. I came in here for the magic ink for the wizard, but there are three statues that have different effects. One allows you to wipe the memory of your former spouses, if it comes to that. That costs 30,000 gold, by the way. The second one, for the cost of a prismatic shard, will turn any children that you have into dust and makes them fly away, which permanently removes them from the game. We're gonna see if children are any less annoying in 1.6, we'll find out. And the final one, for the cost of a strange bun, will lift the magic seal of protection from your farm, allowing monsters to appear on your farm at night. There also just happens to be a back door to the wizard's tower here, so I use it to turn in that magic ink right away. And then on the morning of day 14, our first star fruit crop is ready to harvest, so I do just that and replant it with, you guessed, it more star fruit. And I'm feeling like I need more kegs, so it's off to the tree farm to chop down the entire thing. I'm leaving the mystic trees up because they're too valuable to chop down, but everything else goes. I need wood. I end up with a pretty decent haul of lumber, so I'm hoping this is enough for our next keg expansion. The next day, it's back to the routine of just hunting for RNG drops on the island. The dig site is a staple of this because there's a bone that we can only get from panning in this river. That's a big reason why I upgraded the pan to iridium quality because eh, if it makes this easier, I'll take it. Probably one of the most dense places to get golden walnuts is the archaeologist tent. You find different bone items in different regions for different tasks. There are a couple that are a little tedious to get, but we will get them eventually. I just need to diligently come and check every day. On the Ginger Island farm now, our melon has finally grown Grown up, so the three crops that I planted specifically for the Gorman Frog are ready to go. Do not harvest these. With them fully grown, you can just go into the cave and talk to the frog three times and he will give you 15 golden walnuts for growing one of each of his requests. Okay, now we can harvest them. It's time to expand our kegs a bit more, and one of the more secluded areas is the bus tunnel. Let's not worry about the logistics of getting a bus through here, because I'm filling it with kegs. First, I'm making sure to drop a battery pack into the little box in the wall. This is for a key quest. But then I once again fill up the entire area with kegs, loading them with wheat until they're ready to be synced up with the quarry kegs. The next day, I'm back at the tree farm, replanting that entire thing. 
This time I'm placing 50 oak saplings along the first row. Those are gonna be tapped once again. Then I'm gonna be filling up the rest of the space with pine trees, which are pretty much just for cutting down. I might tap a couple for some pine tar, but I'm kind of eh about it. While I was in the area, I decided to check out those monster hunter goals and holy moly, all we need are five magma sprites. That's all I need for the protector of the valley goal. Well, that's gonna be easy to clean up on the island, but first on even non-rainy days on Ginger Island, after unlocking the resort, the pirates visit the cove. If you win a darts three times here, you get more golden walnuts, so yes please. Then once I knock that off, I spend the last few hours of the day back in the mines and boom, there it is. The last monster hunting goal is completed. And since the Adventurer's Guild is now open all the way till 2 a.m. in the 1.6 update, I just had to go look at it. Oh, would you just look at it? You know what they say about monster eradication goals, you know, you gotta look at them, you know, would you just look at it? Turning wheat into beer in the kegs is actually the most efficient gold per day that you can get out of the kegs. The downfall is that it's a lot more micromanagey, having to swap out these kegs every day until they sync up with my quarry kegs. It's then off to Cliffs to process a massive amount of geodes I really want to finish this museum collection, but despite my best efforts, we won't be finishing that off today. Back on the island, I find myself with a small surplus of walnuts, so I decide to unlock the mailbox for five and the farm totem for 20? Yes, 20. I had to double check that. This allows us to warp directly back to the farm from Ginger Island. As I continue working towards my endgame goals, traveling around the world faster is definitely gonna help. Or I guess more accurately, I could say that more free access to the world is beneficial. Also, you might notice a gigantic egg sitting in my inventory. I managed to find myself an ostrich egg out here, and although I can't do anything with it yet, he he he. I never said anything about making a chicken egg empire. After collecting a total of 100 or more golden walnuts, you unlock the key room. This is gonna open up some seriously awesome endgame items. Just like the community board back in the valley, there is a new quest here available every Monday. They are definitely more challenging, but reward you with a new currency, key gems. You can then exchange those key gems for incredible things, like the horse flute that will summon the horse to our side instantly anywhere. Well, anywhere but the mines. There's also heavy tappers for more syrups, a key to the town to give access to all buildings any time of day. But the thing I'm pursuing first are the galaxy souls. I'm gonna need three of these to upgrade our galaxy hammer to the infinity gavel. And because the key quest that I chose was to collect and submit four prismatic shards, I'm back in the skull cavern mines. You may not believe me, but despite all of the mining that I've done so far, I'm actually pretty low on iron. The excitement continues because on the morning of day 19, our indicator keg is ready to go. So our primary objective today becomes swapping out all of our kegs to start producing starfruit wine. Strawberry wine is nifty and all, but starfruit wine is where it's at. I want this batch ready as soon as possible because I'm actually gonna pull all of my strawberry wine out of my casks in order to put in the starfruit wine once it's ready. Then it's back out to Ginger Island to once again harvest up all the wheat and plant down more wheat. I definitely feel like I could have used this Ginger Island farm more effectively, but we'll see how it plays out in the long term. After all, last winter I did run out of things to put in the kegs, so it's nice to have backup, but still. I've spent a fair amount of time swapping out wheat fields, and gosh, there's just so much on my plate right now. Overnight, my lone cow steak gives birth to another baby, so I name it ABOMINATION! and I'll be selling it immediately the next morning. But I don't want another mouth to feed right now. Then it's more adventures in the mine, and this time I'm definitely pushing to get down to level 100. I brought bombs, I brought staircases, and the reason I did this is for A, a quest, and B, the lower you get, the higher chance of iridium ore and prismatic shards. I make it to floor 100 where Mr. Key is waiting for us. He calls me dishonorable, but smart for using so many staircases to get down here. He praises my dedication nonetheless, and that's another quest knocked off. Our reward is a permanent increase of 25 to our health. That's gonna be helpful. And as fortune would have it, as I ready myself to go home at 1.30 in the morning, I have my four prismatic shards. The next morning, I'll show you a little bit of that greenhouse maintenance that I mentioned before. I acquired a couple of rare seeds from the traveling merchant over the last few months. 
They take 28 days to grow, and once they're ready, I process them through seed makers to make even more. It's the same principle as the ancient fruit seeds that I've been gathering. However, ancient fruits are a multi-harvest crops, whereas sweet gem berries are single. I hold on to one sweet gem berry, which I'll be using right away. You also might notice the treasure totems. We'll be playing with those today, too. After dealing with that, I take that extra sweet gem berry that I saved down to the secret woods. If you give a sweet gem berry to the statue in the northwest corner, you'll be rewarded with a star drop. Yummy, yummy. That's gonna give us four out of seven total star drops. Then it's back to Ginger Island to turn in those prismatic shards. I can't really afford anything impactful with the key gems yet, so I'm just gonna hold on to them for now. And it's more of the same doing my loop of Ginger Island and coming back on day 22 to the tree farm. I did use tree fertilizer on it, which is why this batch grew so quickly. Tree fertilizer has definitely been my biggest sink of fiber so far, because I want kegs and I want casks. I then stop by Robin's to build a couple of farm buildings. With the kegs now removed from my farm, I have this little bit of extra space and I want to start playing with the layout a little bit. This definitely feels like something I have to set and then just stare at for a while until the idea hits me. I'm actually buying the cabins that are meant for multiplayer. I won't reveal why quite yet, but I'll let that one stew in your brains for a while. The reason I didn't consider the basement upgrade as the final farmhouse upgrade is because we can continue to add rooms now. And it looks like in 1.6, even more rooms got added, like the attic and the cubby. These cost quite a bit of money, but rest assured that I will be getting all of them. Ugh, and I'll keep the crib around for now. I then process more geodes at Clint, just hoping and hoping to finish off this museum collection. Unless I'm mistaken, I have three items left to get. And my new community board quest for the week is hunting down bug meat in the mines. The community board quests are giving us some good unlocks as well as more friendship with the townspeople. Day 23, I replant the tree farm, but this time I don't have the fertilizer to do the entire thing. So I won't fertilize anything this time and save the fertilizer for better things. With all of this extra wood now, you bet your butts it's time for more kegs. I keep filling up areas in the world with kegs, but don't worry, the long-term plan is to make everything centralized back at the farm. My new key quest this week is called Danger in the Deep, and this one is super important. The Stardew Valley mines have been completely reset. Our goal is to make it down to floor 120 once again in the next week. But something's a little bit different. These are now the hard mode mines. There are different and more difficult enemies in these mines, and they also come with a new ore called radioactive ore. And you thought iridium was the end game ore, no way man. Well, I guess it is, but the radioactive ore allows us even more crafts, such as those heavy tappers that I mentioned from the key store. And oh boy, if you want to talk about inventory management, these mines have so many items. Now that I've unlocked these hard mode mines, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in them. Probably one of the most threatening things in these mines are these ghosts. Not the green ghosts themselves, but these little slimers are able to give us a debuff. That nauseated debuff prevents us from eating. Not being able to eat and recover health in the mines, especially the hard mode mines, doesn't feel good. I didn't exactly know what to do about this debuff, so I tucked tail and ran away from the mines once my health got pretty low. There's still like two minutes on the debuff as well, so I guess for the second time this playthrough, I'm gonna go to the spa to recover. It's not gonna help at all with the debuff itself, but at least we can get our health back and jump back into the mines while the debuff ticks down. Just to help progress through this mine as well, I've actually swapped out my parrot trinket for the basilisk paw. The Basilisk Paw makes you immune to debuffs, so that solves that problem for now. As a quick spoiler, during the fall season, I figure out that you can actually eat ginger to get rid of the nauseated debuff. Very cool. And the next couple of days are spent just questing down through the mines. The monsters in the hard mode mine also have a chance of dropping key gems, so I have been taking advantage of that. As you can tell though, these mines are not for the faint of heart. You should come prepared. On the evening of day 26, I make it down to floor 120, completing the quest. I feel that getting this quest as only our second key quest was so lucky. Finishing Danger in the Deep allows us to now toggle between the hard mode and regular Stardew mines. The hard mode mines are gonna be farmed very soon, especially in the floor 40 to 60 range where I can get all of this hardwood, mahogany saplings, and iron, which I very much need right now. 
The morning of day 27, we have our second starfruit harvest ready, and this time I won't be replanting anything because no crops grow in two days. This ends up working out beautifully because on the same morning, our batch of starfruit wine is ready. So after harvesting, I just take all of that freshly picked starfruit and pop it right into the kegs. I've also slightly expanded the kegs, also now taking over this section of the bus tunnel. No NPCs path through here, so I don't have to worry about the safety of my kegs. Eggs. And speaking of starfruit wine, check it out, our basement is now full of silver quality strawberry wine, which compared to starfruit wine is kinda garbage, so I'm gonna be replacing all of this with starfruit wine. The way I saw it, I might as well have had these casks aging something, right? And there's nothing more exciting to report, finding ourselves on the final day of summer year two. The first order of business is heading up to the tree farm to get more of that mystic sap. Currently, the goal with the mystic sap is to turn it into the treasure totems. This is because I so desperately want to finish my museum collection. I have other plans for the mystic sap after this, but uh, you'll find out about those later. Then it's off to Clint's where I have a chess pop down outside so that I can really maximize my processing potential. I've actually been taking all of the Omni Geodes that I've been getting recently and exchanging them at the Desert Trader for artifact troves. I was mistaken earlier, by the way. After this batch, I only have three items left to find. Speaking of those treasure totems, let's go have a little bit of fun with them on the island. One of the last skeleton items that I need for the archaeologist comes from Golden Coconuts. I haven't had much luck finding them yet, but uh, these treasure totems are gonna help with that. Let it be known that I am fully aware that I am not using these totems to their full potential. There's definitely some overlap in the spots, but I really wanted to do a big hoe charge and hoe up a huge amount of them at once. Gosh, that is just so satisfying. I then take them to Clint for processing, getting the skull that I needed, as well as a banana sapling. Any banana saplings that I find are going straight to the greenhouse. I want bananas pronto. That skull is actually the last piece that I needed to finish off the archaeology tent, heading back there to turn it in. With the collection complete, the archaeologist rewards us with the recipe for an ostrich incubator. That ostrich egg that I mentioned earlier, we now have a use for it. I'm gonna have to leave you in suspense for that one though, because this season is over. I didn't make a ton of money directly, but you don't know what's in my chests right now. I want to extend a special thank you to all of those generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your generosity makes this content possible for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. Watching all the way until the end and your engagement help my channel so much. If you feel like I've earned it, consider leaving a like and comment about the run, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Good day! If you'd like to keep up with my future releases, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video. I have big plans as always, so stay tuned for those. Until next time, take care everyone.